citizen intrusion detection, uh, has come up with ideas that have found their way into multiple products. He works now for Tenable, uh, a ma major security uh, company, as an inspiration and, and, and senior engineer, um, and exhibits a, a kind of scholarship that, that is uh, worth noting because of what gets built. He also exhibits something else uh, in an academic environment. Those of us who've gone on and gotten tenure or who've uh, achieved a certain level of seniority uh, are supposed to be able to speak our minds and talk about controversial, uh, controversial subjects. Sometimes in the outside world, when you talk about controversial subjects, you find your employment options somewhat limited. Um, Marcus has been very outspoken about a lot of things over the years. And because of his seniority and because they're very thoughtful things, uh, he's uh, inspired many and continued to be able to uh, voice sometimes controversial opinions. Uh, today's talk is more along those second lines than the first, but something that is very well worth hearing because of what we do in computing and its relation to privacy. Uh, and so without taking any more of his time, uh, please join me in welcoming Marcus Renner. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as I, uh, I tried to warn Spaff earlier, this is an overtly political talk. Um, I, normally, I normally talk technology, but um, this is not a technical problem. Privacy is not a technical problem. Privacy is a political, economic, and social problem. Um, if you're a Marxist, it's a class problem. Um, and we can solve the technical problems fairly easily. And one of the things that I think you, you've, you've probably, if you've, unless you've been sleeping under a rock for the last year, you've probably noticed that there is a dialectic going on between people who are interested in privacy and the government, which is also interested in privacy for, in an adversarial sense. And so, so I'd like to explore some of that and talk about some of the issues surrounding that. Um, and um, I, I'm going to have to couch a lot of these as sort of quasi-philosophical arguments. I mean, they're not, they're not, they're not going to survive a Socratic inquiry, um, but uh, well, let, let, me just, let me just launch into it. Uh, Dan Geer used to say that privacy and security is the ability to control the frequency, time, and duration of the disclosure of information. It's a great definition, actually, and I really, I really enjoy that one. I see privacy and secrecy as the same thing, right? You can't really have privacy unless you can keep a secret. You, you don't want privacy unless you want to keep a secret. That's a theme that we're going to explore a fair bit today because everything that you would, all the reasons why you would want to do anything with privacy involve you wanting to do something that you want to keep secret from somebody else. Um, a number of years ago, because of some issues surrounding privacy, I decided I was going to lead a completely open life. And so um, my commitment to leading an open life involved putting my home phone number and all sorts of stuff on my website. You can annoy me at 3 o'clock in the morning if it makes you happy. I might come bring it home to you if you do that, <laughs> um, um, which is not an idle threat. But uh, um, the, the, the the, the reason this is important is because one of the ways of disarming this question of, of secrecy is if you actually don't have any secrets, then you really don't have anything to hide unless it's you know, disgusting or something, uh, something like that, which means that one of the other ways of solving this question of, of disgusting is well, maybe you just simply decide it's not my problem if it's disgusting. So for example, if anybody here wants to hack my cell phone uh, picture feed, you have been warned. Um, anyway, or in fact, if you want, I'll be happy to forward it to you. Again, you have been warned. Um, so these are some ways of dealing with these kinds of problems that are maybe a little bit outside of the box. And, and you know, we're going to explore some outside of the box concepts as, as I go along. Um, one of the things that comes up a lot, uh, I, I'm not sure the right word to use for them. Um, I suppose I should probably give another disclaimer, which is I guess you'd, you'd say I'm a bit of a lefty, probably an anarchist, certainly a socialist. At the very least, I'm a socialist. Um, uh, I don't have a word for the, the people um, who always accept the narrative of the state 
I, I think of them as bootlickers, but let's call them statists. Those are the people who basically uh, take the assumption. Right? So an anarchist takes the assumption that governments are not to be trusted because governments have done tremendous amounts of wrong. And after all, I am not going to do wrong unless the government forces me to do wrong. Um, the statist takes the view that government is doing right because government is necessary to prevent anarchy and to prevent chaos and a bunch of other bad things like that from happening, you know, dogs and cats fornicating and things like that. So we need a government to keep people from giving in to their baser urges and spending their entire time playing World of Warcraft or whatever bad thing it is that the government doesn't want you to do, doing dope, sniffing glue, whatever. And so the statist response on the issue of privacy historically has been philosophically very stupid, which is if you've got nothing to hide, you're not, if you're not doing anything wrong, you've got nothing to hide, which is actually, I kind of agree with that, right? Now, there's still another issue, which is that you have a right to privacy, I would argue, simply for aesthetic reasons. It might be fun to keep a secret. And if so, I would say, again, as, as a non-statist, I would say you have every right to keep a secret if you think it's fun, right? This could be a lot of fun, right? We, we do this all the time. You keep secrets at Christmas. I don't tell my girlfriend what I'm giving her for Christmas, no matter how many times she asks until Christmas, then she, then she finds out. Um, okay, so let's jump into this question of privacy in the government and, oh, oh no, I made it go secure, sorry. Um, <laughs> Okay, so a more fair version of the, the argument as it stands is a kind of utilitarian consequentialist argument, right? So the utilitarian argument is that the, the state has some utility, government has some utility, the purpose of government is to protect you, it's to provide for the common defense, it's to defend us from other citizens as well as other governments. Um, in other words, it's like a mafia thug, right? Um, and in return for that, it only takes you know, whatever it wants from you. Um, but in order to allow the government to protect you better, you have to give up certain pieces of privacy. That's been the assertion since the, well, for a long time anyway, right? And the theory is that this is done in accordance with the rule of law. There's some kind of a balance. We, we, we like to think that there's a check and a balance in place where the government gives you protection against unspecified or specified bad things and in return you give the government a little bit of your rights. You give the government the privilege or the responsibility, depending on how you want to put it, to infringe upon your rights in a controlled sense. Right? And if you're, if you're a believer in the social contract, what you're basically saying is this is all done under the aegis of the social contract. So as, as part of consenting to be governed, this is part of the consent that I gave, is that when the government comes with a warrant and says, I would like to go look inside your underwear drawer, I go, well, OK, that looks like a valid warrant. Put the gun down, please. Uh, and then I show them the contents of my sock drawer, and they go, socks. Um, but the idea of this is it's all based on rule of law, and the government has to justify its actions based on some kind of a pro evidence and or probable cause. This is absolutely critical. And as we look at what's been going on with privacy in the digital age and the evolution of the American police state, you'll see that this question of probable cause um, and or evidence that would lead you to probable cause has gone horribly awry. And that's really the first chink in the arm of this argument that I'm going to start to start to dig on. Right? And the first part of that chink is an incontrovertible fact that the government has conspired to bypass the ostensible protections that it offers us, which is really interesting, right? The, 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 the snappy witticism that I would throw is if you don't think it's illegal, why are you trying to bypass it, right? The simple response that I could give to the government is if you're, not, if you're trying to access my communications by entering into an arrangement, uh, a data sharing arrangement with the, the Australians, the Israelis, and the British, uh, so that you can get at my data when it goes through British data space and then the NSA can query it from there. If you're trying to do this, you have actually admitted that you know that it's wrong, right? Because you've admitted that you know that I wouldn't give it to you freely because you have admitted that you know I wouldn't give it to you freely because if you thought I would give it to you freely, you would just ask it. I mean, honestly, if somebody from the FBI shows up at my doorstep and says they want all of my emails, I will ask them if they brought their own hard drive. Um, because I really don't care 
they're welcome to all of the stuff that's in there, and I, you know, I hope they die of boredom looking at it. But one of the things that we will see is that the U.S. government, particularly the intelligence community, has this thing that's called the Five Eyes Program. It's the UK-USA Treaty Group. This goes back to the Echelon days in the early 80s. Um, and the way that this treaty sharing works is the different members of the, this, this, this five-state cabal um, in some cases are required by law not to spy on their own people. So the British spy on the Americans and the Canadians spy on the Americans, the Americans spy on the Canadians and the British, and if the Brits want to know what somebody is doing, they can access that from an NSA server under a data sharing agreement, right? If you think, some of you are smiling around here, it, it, this seems ridiculous, right? It's not. This is, this is Jesuitical parsing and fine slicing of the highest degree, but this is actually what's going on. And it, it plays itself out in a lot of very interesting ways. And so you get very strange things like that the, the U.S. until recently, um, you remember a company called BlackBerry? Uh, I mean, their servers were up in Canada. And it was the most popular data communications portable device for the U.S. government, so that the U.S. government could spy upon itself without having to violate any of its self-imposed rules. Um, by simply getting the data from CSE up in Canada when the data went up north. Once it has gone up north, then it's fair game for the NSA to capture it. Okay. So this is increasingly fine parsing that's going on to the point where the FBI is doing things like saying, well, uh, data at rest, if it's being stored on a server that you don't own, is not yours. So it's okay for us to just steal it. Right? So the FBI basically will go and declare that if your email is sitting on an inbox in Google, that it's data at rest on someone else's server, it's not yours, you have no expectation of privacy. How many of you think you have an expectation of privacy in your Google email? I would, I mean, I don't actually expect privacy. But the point is, if I'm carrying on an affair with somebody or I'm buying drugs or whatever, obviously I have an expectation of privacy or I wouldn't be doing that, right? If I was swapping pictures of my hairy backside with somebody, I kind of expect that to be private because otherwise I would just be walking around without any pants, right? So what's been going on is that there's been this increasingly fine parsing and that's motivated reasoning. And the motivation of that reasoning is to bypass the protections that have been put in place for private data. In other words, if you don't know that you're not supposed to have it, you won't try to steal it which is exactly what they're doing, right? So this increasingly fine parsing of what constitutes surveillance has also been taking place to the point where uh, there was some great news that came out last week about that uh, the, uh, the FBI um, and possibly the NSA and possibly the CIA have you know, fake cell phone towers that simply act as a man in the middle so they're able to record all of this stuff and at that point once it's going through their cell phone tower then they're not stealing your data because it's their data they're just capturing it right sounds legit it's complete nonsense if you actually start to think about it for a couple of seconds right the point is that they're doing this in order to parse around the letter of a law which they know says you shouldn't be doing this in the first place because otherwise they wouldn't be stealing it. Right. So they have basically declared that as your cell phone gives up your location it is part of your uh, uh, part of its normal transactions which is to say every single iPhone in the world is now data at rest um, and then they can do whatever they want with it um, which is you know kind of interesting stuff. Okay so let's let's zoom back a little bit let's talk about the history of privacy and privacy in the United States. The Constitution says nothing about the right to privacy. It says something actually better, but um, it says that unless we give, right, and now this is where the classical anarchism comes in, right? Unless we give an authority to the state, it is retained by the people. Unless the state gives an authority to the federal government, signs, signs an authority to Congress, it's retained by the state, okay? Somehow or other that got reversed. Somehow or other it got reversed to the point where if you didn't, if you didn't, um, nail it down, we can take it. Oh, and by the way, if we can pry it up, you didn't nail it down. That, that's kind of how that, that <laughs> logic has flipped itself around. Okay, so the Constitution doesn't say anything about privacy, which means that privacy in principle would fall under the, the things that belong to the individual and not to the state. Although the current trend is you belong to the state, so all this stuff is, is also the state's. 
The Bill of Rights covers this. Um, the Fourth Amendment, you've got the privacy of persons and possessions against unreasonable searches. Um, the Fifth covers the uh, privilege against self-incrimination, which is actually critical to privacy. A lot of people don't realize that the Fifth Amendment is a crucial privacy right. One of the things that the Fifth Amendment says is that you can't beat me into disclosing information that's going to get me in trouble. Right? So you can't waterboard me or enhanced interrogate me or tickle me or whatever the word for the day of torture is and use that as information against me in spite of the fact that we do that all the time. But uh, in principle, you can't do that. If I'm a citizen and I've got good lawyers and I'm rich and white, you certainly can't do that. But if I don't have good lawyers and I'm not rich and I'm not white, then knock yourself out. Um, so the privilege of self-incrimination is critical. And then the, the point I men mentioned earlier, which is the enumeration of rights not to be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people. What that means is, if we didn't give you the right to do it, you can't just take it. In other words, the default is it's nailed down. And the default is, if I catch you prying it up, you are violating the Constitution. That's the default. You won't hear that talked about very much in Washington. So let's kind of zoom that back a little bit further. The Fourth Amendment is really the center of the privacy debate in the United States. And that revolves around the question of unreasonable search. Unreasonable search and seizure. Seizure is interesting, but here, here's the issue. You can't seize something unless you search for it especially if there's a warrant involved or probable cause involved. I'll get to that in a second, right? Here's the critical, the, the money shot, if you will. No warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized. Is that unclear to anyone here? Amazingly, there's tons of high-powered lawyers in Washington who simply can't understand that fairly simple sentence. It's kind of interesting, right? They kind of go, well, oath or affirmation, you know, if it's on a web page, it's an oath, right? Uh, there's all kinds of strange stuff. Warrants describing the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized. On the face of it, a Driftnet search or a John Doe search is impossible because you can't describe something you don't know what it is. If you don't know what email address Marcus is using, then you can't describe what email address you want to look for in order to determine that Marcus is using it. This is pretty simple logic. Somehow or other this got perverted by the FBI and the NSA into you can collect everything and then try to figure out which was Marcus's and then go get a warrant asking for that specific thing after you figured it out, which is, uh, the word for that is cheating. On the face of it, it's unconstitutional, but that's the situation that we're in right now, okay? So we need, to, we need to make sure we've got the level set there. Metadata, <laughs> you've all heard about the metadata thing. The metadata thing is a red herring the size of a blue whale, which is about the size of a school bus. It's a great big red herring. Here's what the metadata argument is all about. The metadata argument is what we're doing is we're collecting things like the sender, recipient, date, time, stamp, uh, contact information, message size, uh, duration of the connection, all this kind of stuff. When you talk about metadata, that's what you're thinking that they're talking about. But that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about stuff that's inside the message. Some of you, some of you who've looked at the SMTP protocol know that SMTP contains an envelope in which you've got the sender, the recipient, all that kind of stuff. Then you've got the data portion of the message. The data portion of the message has got another sender, another recipient, a subject line, and a size and keywords and a whole bunch of other stuff, right? So there's metadata and there's metadata. Another piece of metadata is the TCP connection that that SMTP goes over. So when they talk about metadata, what they're trying to do is kind of do the, you know, look over here at the big shiny thing and make you think that what they're collecting is just the metadata regarding the message delivery, but actually what they're doing is they're also pulling up stuff like the subject lines, which is inside the envelope. So if you want to use the analogy of the envelope, what they're trying to get you to do is to think that, you're, that they're recording the, um, 
the recipient address and the return address on the outside of the paper envelope that's being sent. There's no way they're steaming it open. Well, actually, they're steaming it open just a little bit, but they're only scanning it. They're, not, they're just putting it on the scanner, doing a little keyword searches, but they're not actually reading it. They're just kind of, kind of scanning it. But here's the problem. Th this is the philosophical argument on this. If you can actually generate suspicion from it, it's not metadata anymore. It's data, right? The data turns into information when you process it into some kind of a context that gives it meaning. So at the point where you take metadata and you do something useful with it, like integrate it against my contact list and find out who I've been talking to lately, you are generating data and that data is private. Or I would argue that that data is private, even if it's them generating it. Right, so that's another interesting question. But here's the, here's the funniest part. Imagine for a second that you're some NSA analyst and you've built a system that actually works just on metadata, right? And this thing works perfectly. It works exactly the way it's supposed to. And one day you go to your boss and you say, boss, I have a triple red flag alert for terrorism going on between this address here and that address there. And the boss goes, great, well, who is this? I don't know. What do you mean I don't know? What do you mean you don't know? Well, all I have is the metadata. Well, what's going on? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Well, I, I know that there were some communications that indicate a possible terrorist plot, but since we don't actually have the message because we're only keeping the metadata, you see how this works? There's absolutely no reason why anyone in their right mind would build a system for doing this kind of analysis that didn't also keep the data. The reason that they keep the data is because when they generate enough of a suspicion from the metadata, then they write themselves a warrant, they approve the warrant, and then they retrieve the message that's linked to the metadata because it's all in the same servers. Right. And Edward Snowden has showed us that this is exactly what's happening, except for the warrant part. They don't really do the warrant. What they do is they think really hard. They think a warranty kind of thought, and then they just access the information. But as long as they've thought about a warrant, it's OK. I'm being a little sarcastic there. But um, another piece of this is that the NSA has promoted this idea that it's not search unless human eyeballs do it. Right? So if I give you this pile of papers with private information, you have an actually searched it, even though you've got it and you've folded it up, unless you actually read it, you haven't searched it or you haven't seized it. Right? Um, so that's an interesting, interesting argument, except for the fact that it also is, is mostly BS, because what we're talking about is a robotic searching system. So, so you take my stack of papers, you scan them, you run them through, you run them through an optical character recognition thing, and then you look for naughty words in there, and you discover that I actually gave you a couple pages of 50 pages, of 50 shades of gray, or whatever it is, and it's a bad thing, and now I'm in trouble, right? Um, of course, you've done all of this without actually somehow actually looking at my data. How does this work? Well, a computer looked at it. It's not an actual human looking at it. So, so basically what's happened is that the intelligence community has defined searching as uh, when a human eyeballs a thing. It's, 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 it's very Schrodinger's cat-like, right? Um, uh, quantum mechanics would, would have a lot of fun with this, but it hasn't actually been searched. And, and, I think where this is going to wind up is that we haven't actually searched your data until we put handcuffs on you. And at the point where we put handcuffs on you, then we search your data, because then we thought really hard about a warrant and we put handcuffs on you. Um, so this is another way of fine parsing uh, what is a reasonable practice for privacy in order to accomplish some kind of an additional agenda that's actually outside of the rule of law. All right, so I kind of already talked about this, but let me, let me emphasize this. Metadata is not worth collecting unless it contains private information because you can't actually get enough information from just the metadata unless you salt it with enough information to get probable cause that someone's doing something bad so you can write a warrant and then do a full search. But the crazy part is by the time you've got enough information to get a warrant to do a full search, you've already done a full search. It's like, imagine, if you will, that you guys are all wondering whether I have a gun in my sock drawer. By the way, in the interest of full disclosure, there is a gun in my sock drawer. Okay, but you're, you're wondering if there's a gun in my sock drawer, right? Now, I just kind of gave the whole game away there, but how do you find out if there's a gun in my sock drawer without either asking me or maybe 
opening the drawer a bit. Well, you could weigh the drawer. You could shake the entire cabinet and see if it rattles in a suspicious way. You could say, there's no way Marcus's socks weigh that much. It's a big gun. Um, you know, <laughs> it's actually not that big. But, um, you know, there's no way Marcus's socks would rattle like that, so there must be something else in there. Now we're going to get a warrant. Oh, look, surprise, it's a gun, right? Because you've already determined before you got the warrant that there's a freaking gun in the sock drawer. And that's basically what's going on here. So it's very, very difficult to frame a warrant for bulk data collection within the scope of the Fourth Amendment. The crazy part is the national security establishment does this all the time, right? You, all of those, all of those uh, Patriot Act national security letters, all 70,000 that they sent to Google or whatever it was last year, right? All of those are warrants to access people's private information based on what? based on looking at their information already, right? Um, and so that's one of the problems. One of the other problems is it, it appears that one of the things that's going on with the national security letters is that possibly it's the FBI, possibly it's some other agency, are showing up and they're saying, we have a warrant for your encryption keys for the website that all these 150,000 people are using. So we want the, you know, we want the, we want the secret exponent of the RSA key for, for Google or something like that, so that now we can crack your SSL. And the interesting question is, what do you think Google does? Of course, they, you know, do you want that on a USB stick or should we put it on a DVD? I mean, what else are you gonna do? Because you, you have to do business, right? So they're not gonna give up your password. They don't care about your password. They're gonna give up the keys for the master, the master key for everything. Another thing to think about is that unfortunately, the master keys for everything are actually fairly easy to steal. All, right. All you need is you need one server-side buffer overrun that's going to allow you to scrape the entire memory of the web server and the keys are in there. And uh, do you think that a bunch of spies would hesitate to do that? Um, yeah, think about that one. Um, okay, so when the Constitution was written, the premise was um, okay, so there's, there's an alternative narrative that you can use about American history. One of the, one narrative is that the country was founded by a bunch of patriots who were freedom-loving people who threw off the shackles of King George and, and started the greatest country in the world. The other narrative is that you had a bunch of power-hungry bastards who didn't trust each other at all who certainly didn't want to pay any taxes. And so they, they basically managed to boot England out of the picture so they could avoid having to pay any taxes, which was great for them. But they didn't mind a whole bunch of other people dying and a whole bunch of other people paying taxes. And within 10 years of them coming to power, they had created this political system that allowed them to exist so that none of them could gain power over the others. So they produced this very interesting flat power sharing arrangement that prevented them from spying on each other or taxing each other. Um, and everybody else could go hang. So that's one way to think about it. Um, <clears throat> in 1776, if you wanted to talk about metadata, it'd be the equivalent of collecting facts about people on a turnpike. And if you actually went to the founding fathers and said, we want to track everybody who's going down thus and such turnpike, they would have had a fit, right? Because that would have exposed all kinds of private stuff that they were doing, like planning a revolution, um, which you know, wouldn't go down so well because their heads would wind up on pikes. Um, and you could, you, could, you could find all kinds of fascinating stuff. And this is the reason why the Fourth Amendment exists in the form that it exists. It's to prevent these kinds of things from happening. The problem is, as the state metastasized, it didn't want to be able to allow people to do that anymore. There's a fantastic paper. Um, the URL is a little bit difficult to, uh, to read here, but Kieran Healy did an article called Using Metadata to Find Paul Revere. I highly recommend it. Um, he basically showed some techniques where you could simply do clustering analysis on a group of patriots and figure out who was the one who was the communications nexus between all of them. It's a form of traffic analysis. It's pretty fun. Okay, so you're thinking I'm crazy. That's fine. Let's go. Um, the Founding Fathers, like I said, <laughs> were fairly concerned with privacy and search. Why? Because they were mostly criminals. First off, they were, they were revolutionaries. They were, they were traitors to England. They would have probably been hanged 
uh, if they had been caught at the right time during that particular process. But before that, before all that, if you actually study the history, the unwritten history of the United States, these guys were deeply, profoundly concerned about taxation. Um, right, -wings, right wingers tend to generally be because right wingers tend to be rich and they want to keep their stuff. They want to keep their ill-gotten gains. Um, many of them were smugglers. Uh, John Hancock's a prime example. He made a huge fortune smuggling. Um, search and seizure was a huge deal for John Hancock. He liked the idea of not being able to have people go on his ship and find that he had rum from Barbados that he hadn't paid any taxes on. The, the, the American tax revolt was essentially a tax revolt from rich people who were trying to avoid excise taxes. And if you actually study the history of the various taxes that were going on, what you're going to see is you're going to see that the crown was like trying to nail jello to a wall. Every time they would try to think of a way that they could tax this illicit commerce that was going on, mostly rum to Barbados and slaves, right? There's a lot of rum and, tra and slave trading going on, um, as well as cotton. They wanted, to track, they wanted to track this so that they could tax it, and then the people would move it so that it would go out of a different harbor or something like that. Um, and that's the reason why they, uh, you know, the Boston Tea Party was related to tea taxes. It, it always keeps coming back to taxes and tax dodging. So one way of looking at it is that the Founding Fathers were a bunch of filthy tax dodgers. Um, or land, land speculators. A little fact most people don't realize is George Washington did huge trade in land. George Washington was the largest individual property holder in the United States at the time of the Revolution. Um, and he was deeply concerned about real estate taxes for some reason because he would have been bankrupted if he actually had to pay any taxes for the counties that he owned. Um, Jefferson was huge in tobacco and cotton, paid no taxes because it was all being smuggled off to France. Um, yeah, anyway, so search and seizure was a big deal for these guys. They wrote these laws for their own benefit. Oh, so think about that. So these are typical concerns of the wealthy and powerful. Now I'm, I'm, um, oh, well, all right, let me go on. Let me just go on. Okay, for most of human history, Privacy has been a concern of the wealthy and powerful. Why is privacy a concern of the wealthy and powerful? Well, because if we realize, if the, the lumpen proletariat, I'm not one of the lumpen proletariat, by the way. I'm probably close to being one of the 1%, uh, which is, by the way, one per, the 1%, the whole 1% meme is another way of manipulating the people, right? It's not 1%. The problem is not the 1%. The problem is the 1,000th of 1%, who are the bazillionaires. Those are the guys who are the problem. Right. Um, the 1% are bad. I was actually close to the 1% at one point, but the 1% are a big problem. But it's the bazillionaires, the thousandth of the 1% that are, that are the huge problem. And privacy has been the purview of the wealth and pri powerful because peasants don't have anything. Peasants don't have anything to take away. You can take away their turnips. And you can sink your night, you can bash the peasants, you can take their turnips. If they've got some wine, you can take their wine. I suppose you know, levy a tax on it. I mean, that's the, the entire history of the Dark Ages I just gave you right there. It's milking the peasants without killing them, right? But basically, all the peasants have left it to, to, is, is alcohol, dancing, music, and their genitals. That's all the peasants have left. And they're usually too tired from working to do anything with it. They don't need privacy because they've really got nothing to be private about. The wealthy need to conceal it. And most generally, the wealthy need to conceal it from each other. Because if Lord so-and-so finds out that, that Duke such-and-such -such has got a gigantic gold bathtub, he's going to raise up a bunch of bully boys and go over there and beat up Duke so-and-so, and now he's got a gold bathtub. Right? And, and if you think back to the history of monarchies, it's the biggest thug with the best bully boys who's, you know, well, now their descendants are the ruling heads of most of Europe. Um, and, of course, that's what we were rebelling against, right? So we had our own local rich people who didn't want to be ruled by the hereditary rich person from England, so they spun off and, and basically divested themselves. Okay, so the powerful need to conceal themselves because the Game of Thrones does require secrecy. Um, you need to do all of this kind of covert diplomacy if you're going to try to game, if you're going to try to play the Game of Thrones again. Peasants don't need to do this. Peasants don't need covert diplomacy. Normal, normal people don't need covert diplomacy. No, normal people, I would argue, may not need to keep secrets. Normal people need to keep secret a few things. Well, we'd like to keep secret the little tiny bit we're trying to rob from the tax man. 
Um, and we would like to keep secret the fact that, you know, we're messing around with somebody else's wife or whatever it is that we're doing. Um, but it's the rich that are engaged in this flat out misbehavior because, because typically what you've got is you've got the wealthy and powerful do whatever the hell they want. And if we find out about that, we do the pitchforks and torches thing and they get some tumble rides and there's a guillotine. I mean, you know, it's only really happened. It's only really happened once in history that the French Revolution went that way. Um, but it had a very, very memorable impact on the wealthy, right? They, they will not forget that one. Um, one of the problems with quoting Voltaire is if you, tr if you read something brilliant by Voltaire and you can't remember where you found it, you'll never find it again because actually like, like my collected works of Voltaire is this huge bookshelf and I can't remember where he, he said this, but I swear I read this somewhere he said this, which is that once government begins to engage in se secret diplomacy, it cannot last long. And what he means by that is two things. Well, let's just go with one thing. What he means by that is once people in the government realize that they can make secret deals without anyone else having to look over their shoulder, they become habituated to making secret deals. And once they realize they can make secret deals, then they're going to make secret deals behind the king's back too. Right? And if you look again, if you look at history, history is filled with cases where you know, somebody who was a big shot minister decided that he was going to be king because he thinks the king's not such a great guy anymore. Um, and those people need privacy. Now, let's talk about democracy. Um, it shouldn't fool any of you that I don't think this is a democracy that we're in right now. Uh, it's, it's some sort of, it's some sort of the, the, the term that some people use is managed democracy. Uh, it's, more like a, it's more like a corporate oligarchy. It's difficult to figure out exactly what the term for, for, for what this thing is. There actually are probably no democracies on earth. There may never have been any democracies except for like the, the, um, the, the French had one for a very brief period of time under the Commune. But, um, so democracy is a political system in which the people comprise the government. That's the premise. The premise is that the state is an emergent property of all of the people in it. And that's why you get into social contract theory. So all the, people in the, all the people in the nation have agreed to give up some of their rights to form this collective, which is able to wield all of those rights and privileges together. So what I'm essentially agreeing, if I'm in a democracy, is that I am no longer going to hold on to my ability to spend my money on education or roads or spend my money as I see fit. I'm going to give my money to somebody smarter than me who's going to spend that money for me and they bought a freaking F-35 with it, um, which doesn't fly. But anyway, um, the idea is that the government enacts the will of the people, which is a big problem. One of the ways you can tell that you're not in a democracy is when you see things like the you have Pew, Pew Research polls that show that 80% of Americans favor vast reductions in defense spending, but it just never seems to happen, which shows you something that, well, shows you how much your opinion counts, doesn't it? If you're one of the 80%, if, there's, if you're one of the people who favors defense spending, then your government is working great for you. Um, but the rest of us who actually think that education would be good, um, or I don't know, socialized medicine would be good, something like that. Um, which, by the way, if you actually look at the popular polls, a lot of people actually think socialized medicine is a really good idea. Anyone who's been to Canada thinks it's a great idea. Um, for some reason, it never shows up on the, on the to-do list. But here's the problem. When the government ceases to obey the people, by definition, it's no longer democracy. Here's the other problem. When the government se starts to keep secrets from the people, now you have a problem. Because if it's an emergent property of my will, how can I possibly not know what's going on? I cannot make a decision to support something that I don't know what it is. Unless what you're doing is you're asking me to completely abnegate myself and say, you know what, I am such a subject that I trust you completely. You can do whatever you want. And then you do it, and I go, wait, 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 why did you do that, right? I can't do that. You can't keep a secret from yourself. Okay, so <clears throat> one of the consequences from this idea of the democrat, of the democracy, is that people can't possibly spy on themselves. How can you do this? I can't spy on myself. I can't surprise myself. 
the idea of a surveillance state is profoundly undemocratic if you, if you believe in democracy. It's a bad idea, right? Because essentially what you're saying is as an emergent property of the collective will of all the people in this room, we're going to go see his photo stream. What? That doesn't make any sense. Okay. Another consequence is that the government cannot keep secrets from the people. After all, if the government is an emergent property of the people, how can it keep secrets from the people that comprise the government? In a democracy, everything that the, everything that the government did would be completely public. Now, some of you are thinking, but wait, government needs to keep some secrets. Really? Like what? Nuclear launch codes? Well, hmm, maybe, but here's the funny part. You could actually public, actually, I'll tell you what the, the code was for uh, the uh, football during the Reagan administration was 12 zeros. I do know that for a fact. Uh, so, so there you go. Um, but here's the point. I would actually have to get to that device. And there's people there with guns who are going to prevent me from getting to that device. And in that situation, I would say that's part of the government actually working, uh, doing the correct thing on behalf of the people. But, it, but here's the problem. Usually what you're going to find is if the government is keeping secrets from the people, it's because the government is engaging in covert diplomacy. And covert diplomacy, by definition, is bypassing the will of the people, right? If the government is making arrangements behind my back to overthrow the government in some other country, I can't approve of that. In fact, I won't approve of that, but that's exactly what it does, and it's done over and over and over again, which is another way you can point, point to the current state of the U.S. and say, obviously, this is not a democracy that we're talking about. Right? So it can't hide the actions from the people that it's purporting to be operating with the consent of. Otherwise, you have to scrap the notion of the social contract, which is where the anarchist in me comes out and waves a flag and goes, woohoo, right? Say, the government has no legitimacy, we're done, right? There's one problem. It's okay for me to say the government has no legitimacy and to stop believing in it, but it believes in me. And even though I'm willing to say, okay, you guys can all go away, I'm gonna stop paying taxes now, and all that kind of stuff, they'll still come for their slice. Um, <clears throat> so, the other argument that the statist will make is say, well, there's a delegation, right? We live in a representative democracy. That's the other, that, that's the fallback. Okay, we're not a democracy. We're a representative democracy. Yeah, well, so that doesn't work either. And the reason is because the premise of a representative democracy is that you're delegating some of your authority to people who represent your will in government. So, for example, Feinstein on the Senate Intelligence Committee is supposedly watching what the intelligence community is doing on my behalf. Well, I'm not very happy with what she's doing. I have no recourse. Apparently, Feinstein hasn't seen an espionage thing that she didn't like, except for the one time the CIA spied on her and got caught, um, which, is, which is, of course, you know, really hysterical, because um, some, somehow or other, the Congress people appear to be under the illusion that they're not being spied on all the time, um, which is really funny. And actually, I was deeply disappointed because uh, it, did, it didn't happen. I thought that when Snowden started trickling out his disclosures, that there was a, a master trajectory and that the last thing that he was going to trickle out was going to be like the NSA dossiers on a couple of Congress people. That would have blown it all open. At the point, if he, if, if, if he could have come up with, you know, Senator Feinstein's Snapchat thread or whatever, uh, that would have been really interesting. Because they have that. Of course they have that. And if you think I'm sounding like a member of the Tinfall Hat Brigade here, because um, I probably am, uh, you guys all remember General David Petraeus, right? I mean, he, people were starting to talk about Petraeus as a possible candidate for office which should have terrified you. Well, apparently it did terrify somebody. It terrified somebody enough to go back into multiple years worth of his emails and texts and disclose an extramarital affair. How did they get those emails from way back then? Wow, that's really interesting, right? I'm guessing that somebody thought really hard about a warrant and then they got Petraeus's email and then they went, we, we own this guy and we're going to be able to take him off the board. Another way of thinking about that, you guys all remember uh, Elliot Spitzner up in New York, right? Uh, he looked like he might have been a candidate for 
for higher office, and then it was discovered discovered that he'd been buying prostitutes using his corporate credit card, which is a big no-no, by the way, um, in terms of corporate governance. That's that's all. I'm just saying you you don't spend money like that on that. It, you know, keep it under 25 bucks a day. Um, but you know, he was doing that. How was that information discovered? Do 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 your own research on those two. Right? Because what, what we're talking about is that somehow somebody was able to go back from, somebody from the FBI was able to go back multiple years into the guy's credit card history and find out what he was spending it on, which is really interesting because that means there's payer information that's available way back in time that you know, most of us don't. Do. Oh, that's right. They only keep metadata. That's right. Um, okay, so the government can keep secrets from people, maybe, but not from the people's representatives which is another problem, right? Because if Senator Feinstein was actually representing me, Senator Feinstein would be screaming bloody blue murder. There was a recent uh, big thing about, you know, the, the classified report on the CIA torture. And there was some discussion about whether Senator Udall, I guess it is, who's, who's been thrown out, was going to read it into the congressional record like some senator with guts did to the Pentagon Papers. Of course he's not going to do that. It was, a nice, it was a nice suggestion. But the fact is that if any of those people were actually representing me, none of that stuff would be secret in the first place. Because again, if you believe that we're in a democracy, we all collectively bear some responsibility for torturing people. Horrifying. Bugs the hell out of me. I would like whoever it was. It's against the law. I'd like whoever it was who did that to get in trouble, right? Okay. So <clears throat> let's start back over where we began. If you're not doing something wrong, you've got nothing to hide. So let's riff on that. Maybe what we should do is take a consequentialist view or a utilitarian view and say, actually, the, the argument's very good. The utilitarian argument is very good. As I said earlier, we are ceding to government the right to selectively violate our privacy under certain circumstances. Those circumstances are that I am a danger to society. So if the government believes that I'm a danger to society, the government reduces my privacy rights in order to convince itself that I'm not a danger to society. Okay, let's assume that we buy that argument, that we're going to say who is a danger to society and we're going to reduce their privacy rights commensurate with their ability to harm society. Right? If we've got a terrorist who's planning to blow up a building, we want to reduce his privacy rights so that we can stop him from blowing up a building. If we have a congressman who's taking bribes, we want to reduce his privacy rights commensurately, which means that the people who can do the most damage should have the least rights of privacy. Who can do the most damage in this country? Congress, the president, actually anyone who works for the government, anyone who works for the security agencies, and large corporate heads. Right? You can see where I'm going with this. I don't think that anyone who works for the government at all as my employee, they're doubly my employees. First off, they're acting in lieu of me as a representative during that emergent property of, of creating a, a democracy. They're also my employees. So, not, so Feinstein's screwing me twice. Not only is she doing a terrible job of overseeing the intelligence, but she's also getting, taking my money while she's doing it. I'm just picking on her. I, I hate them all. So, so, <laughs> so you probably got that idea. I'm not particularly bashing any one politician. They all suck. Um, but the point is, as constituent and as employee, she's just a disaster. Um, and then the same thing for business leaders, right? As we saw in 2000, 2008, that Wall Street people can have vastly disproportionate damage ability to cause damage. Us peasants, all we can do is drink, maybe listen to Led Zeppelin, maybe smoke a little dope, maybe drink a little too much. There's a very little bit of damage that we can do. I mean, honestly, as a, as a peasant in the United States, probably the most damage I could do is if I get drunk and drive my pickup truck into a telephone pole and cause a small blackout in a small neighborhood for about an hour until they put the wires back up. That's about the most damage that I could do. A senator can do a lot of damage. A president can do a huge amount of damage. I don't think a president should be able to fart without it being caught on camera for people to watch, right? Because this is a person. This is a person whose influence is absolutely disproportional. Corporate heads, all the heads of the big Wall Street firms, we should be able to watch every single thing that they do. It's part of the price that they should pay for all of those billions that they've got. Of course, they don't want that, right? Because if we could actually see what they're doing with all those billions, we'd go, what? How many Lamborghinis do you need? You can only drive one at a time. I mean, you don't need 12, right? Um, okay, so obviously we're not a democracy. That's a big problem. Um, and I'm going to wrap up here in just a minute. 
Um, the, the only contribution I've been able to make to moral philosophy in my life is, is this point, um, which is that power has no value unless you plan to abuse it. Now, there's a different thing that's on the same axis as power, which we would call leadership. Okay? Power is if I say, everybody get out of the room right now, and you guys all jump up and run out of the room. Leadership is if I say, the room is on fire. Perhaps we should exit. And we all do. And once that situation is over, my, my leadership ability, that situation is over, my, I no longer have any power, right? I'm not going to be able to call any of you two weeks after the fire and go, I think you should leave the room. You're going to look at me funny, right? So power and leadership are very, very different things because one is situational. Power attempts to accrue, protect, defend, and perpetuate itself. And so the argument I'm making is that the only value to having power is to plan to abuse it. You're planning on taking advantage of that power that you've got. You're planning on perpetuating. By definition, someone who wants power will eventually be your enemy. Because eventually, it's going to come down to a zero-sum game in which they have more power and you don't, and you're going to lose. OK, so I've kind of already talked about that. Um, the utilitarian argument is that what's good for a society is good for everyone in that society. So you're going to try to reduce the danger and suffering for the most people, which is a good idea. You're going to try to promote the well-being of most people. I like this. There's, there's philosophical quibbles with utilitarianism, like how do we actually know what well-being is? And is well-being something that we can, we can see forward and backward in time, right? Those are, those are some interesting issues. We can say that society can choose to violate someone's privacy for the good of collective. I think we're probably all OK with that. Um, and it's going to be based on the threat that they pose to the collective. You go back to the Fourth Amendment, that's what they're talking about. The idea is if you've got a warrant, if you've got a probable cause, and you think that someone is about to damage the collective, at that point you could violate their privacy and see what they're up to. Right? You know, my earlier example of the gun in the sock drawer would take on a completely different tone if I was sending death threats. Right? I was joking about you wanting to know if there's a gun in my sock drawer, but if I was sending you, one of you guys death threats, it would be completely legitimate for you to go find out what kind of gun I had in the sock drawer, whether it was loaded and whether it looked like I was cleaning it lately or anything like that. Right? So, what we need to do is acknowledge that, that if you're not doing something wrong, you've got nothing to hide, is actually a statement of profound truth. And maybe we should acknowledge that people who think they've got something to hide probably are doing something wrong. It's the where there's smoke, there's fire. And the people who are, the people who are hiding the most are the people we should look at the most. And those are the rich and the powerful. Right? The other possibility we could do which is an interesting one, is we could eliminate the need for personal privacy if we could just get over some of our quirks. Right? If, if I was able to get over my embarrassment at nudity, then I'm sure I, could just, I wouldn't have to put my pictures on iCloud. I could just put them on my website. and You could see my hairy butt or whatever. And all of you could do that. If we, if we all, as a society, could get over being ashamed over being occasionally falling down drunk or cheating on our spouse or all of these things that, are, if you really think about them, they're fairly minor transgressions when you compare them with bombing a country flat or something like that, like governments do. If we could just get over being worried about those little sorts of things, we could completely give up our privacy. And that's the fun part, because if we premise that we completely give up our privacy, then we can ask the governments, the politicians, and the rich to give up all their privacy as well. Now watch what happens. They'll go, screw you. It's not going to happen. OK, so what I think we should do is we should acknowledge that the government actually has no right to privacy. We, the people, maybe have a right to privacy, but it really doesn't matter because what we've got is boring anyway. You can have all my stuff. I really don't care. All right. That's what got me into this idea of just living a completely open life because really, I, I don't care. Um, so you can't hurt me. right? It's the people like David Petraeus or whatever who feel that they've got something to hide. Um, so we have to acknowledge that government workers, as agents of the people, have no privacy. And they can't really claim to be off duty because they work all the time, especially the president. But if you're a spy, you're constantly thinking about stuff. If you work for the intelligence community, you've got all this classified material in your brain. You're an agent of the people. You should be under camera 24-7. Um, again, that's assuming a democracy. Right? <clears throat> so again, I've already kind of talked about that. We could assume that the wealthy have a disproportional influence on the government. It doesn't take any rocket science to make that argument. Right? You talk about the Koch brothers practically buying an election. You talk about Michael Bloomberg buying, buying the mayorhood of New York. You talk about the wealthy, the, the, the Bush dynasty, 
who are extremely wealthy speculators in real estate and oil. Uh, the Bush dynasty buying elections for their useless cokehead son. Um, and we're probably going to get a Jeb in there next uh, or the Clintons. But anyway, I'm just going to slap all those people. Um, in the United States now, a billionaire is actually part of the government. Here's a point that really scared me. I literally shed tears when I realized this. You know what was the first kind of unofficial action that Mark Zuckerberg did after he became a billionaire? He called President Obama because he didn't like the privacy stuff that the NSA, they, he didn't like the, what the NSA is doing, so he called President Obama. What the? It, I don't like what President Obama is doing either. Do you think he'll take my call? Do you think he'll take any of your call? No, because you're not billionaires. If you're billionaires, he'll take your call. If you're not a billionaire, you can kiss off. That's basically the message, right? The government is for the rich, by the rich. And those are the people we should all be looking at collectively. We should be spying and surveilling on every single thing that they do because that's going to reduce the marginal value for them to enjoy all the stuff that they're stealing, right? I mean, unless they're able to be as shameless as I am. I mean, realistically, if, if I was worth $100 million, sure, I'd probably buy a Lamborghini. And I'd go, yeah, it's mine. And screw you. I wouldn't hide it, right? Like Mitt Romney's 12 Cadillacs. What does he do with 12 Cadillacs? I mean, he can actually build Cadillac Henge with 12 Cadillacs. Um, anyway, so the wealthy have no right to privacy. Um, enough of that. Um, anyway, so that's how is this relevant to computer security? The point is, this is completely relevant to computer security. We're the people who built this damn thing. Government is now critically dependent on computing. All the military systems are critically dependent on computing. Which brings me to a fun point. We can take it away from them at any time. So one of the things you might want to think about, if you've been listening to this and maybe gotten a little bit infected with some anarchist ideas from listening to me, maybe you should get a job programming computers for the government. Because you've just written yourself a veto down at the bottom of some piece of code someplace. Maybe you should be the next Edward Snowden. I think what we should have is a thousand Edward Snowdens. The right response to the NSA is to let billions of Snowdens bloom. Right? I mean, I keep thinking, boy, if I could go back to my 20s, I'd get a job working for the CIA. I'd show them what a piker Snowden was. I'd dump the whole thing. I'd steal it all. Right? <laughs> I'd leave with a suburban full of hard drives, and they'd be wondering, how the hell did he do that? And he turned all the system logs off while he was doing it, too. Um, we have to choose whether or not to go along with this. The fascinating thing is we're building our own chains, and someday we're going to be complaining about that. Because what happens is when you aggregate the reins of power too well, once you make, once you make the ability to, to wield power too efficient, once you boil it down to one place, like the nuclear launch codes in the football, you have given that power to the first person who's able to grab that thing. And that's a big, big problem. Right? The good news is the football is actually window dressing. It doesn't really work. So um, you know, what you do is you pick up a telephone and you call the Strategic Air Command. You say, this is the president. I want to do a launch. And that's how it goes down. Um, we have to decide that. And when you read some of this stuff, like Richard Feynman wrote after, after the Manhattan Project was over about sitting in a cafe in New York and imagining an H-bomb going off over Manhattan and thinking, why did we build that thing, right? The time to have that thought is before you build it, not afterwards. Um, it's too late for regrets. So uh, anyway, I think I've got time for like one question, then I'll run away. Well, first of all, thank you very much. We can take a few questions. Please remember to turn your mic on in front before you uh, ask your question. So, anybody? Or are you or not. all overloaded here? Or they think I'm a nut. And those are not mutually exclusive. Oh, I guess philosophically, if. if Got the mic on? I hit the button. So. Yep. Um, philosophically, if our. Representative democracy isn't cutting it. What's your solution as a form of government then that allows? I mean, because we can't have 300 million people decide what's good for the country because it'll never work. We can't get 435 or whatever. That's a that's a wonderful question. Uh, just to repeat it, uh, the question is, um, you know, if I think democracy is not working, what uh, what could we do? Um, the problem is how you get from here to there. Democracy is actually possible. Uh, with the technology that we've got, we could actually go to a direct democracy. 
Um, one of the disadvantages, yeah, I see someone in the back making a face, but there, there's huge disadvantages to that. One of the problems, and Plato said this, democracies almost always devolve to oligarchies, and I think he was right. The problem is, again, you centralize power, and you centralize power in the hands of the power hungry. It's a bad idea. Um, so what do you do? You, we, we could put some research into designing governments that were resistant to graft and were resistant to forming oligarchies. I actually sketched out how one would build one, but it would take me about two and a half hours to, to outline the constitution for that. Um, but it could be done by building, it could be done by building a government in which the proposal of laws was a separate process from the arguing about laws, which was a separate process from the implementing laws. So what I would argue for is a sort of a parallel corporate cluster in which government services were essentially treated as separately managed programs which all had an end of life. So if you, did, if you weren't happy with the Department of Defense, you could just stall and let its budget evaporate after five years, whatever the continuing resolution was. There's things that we could do. And one of the things that really drives me crazy about these kinds of oligo democracies that we've got right now is people will say, you know, democracy is not the best form of government. It's just better than all the others. That's complete bull. Okay, human beings are very smart. We could put some work into trying to figure out what are some structures for creating systems of government that actually might work. Uh, John Rawls, the theory, uh, John Rawls, uh, um, uh, the law of peoples would be a good place to start. Rawls actually lays out how do you build a government which is responsible to the people, and how do you how do you how do you figure all that? One of the other things that Rawls figured out, which I think is, is fascinating and brilliant, is how do you deal, if you're a government that is led by the people, um, how do you deal with a state that refuses to cooperate that's next door to you that's better armed and much more dangerous? Um, I would highly recommend it, although he makes some horrible mistakes around the Vietnam War. Um, one, Rawls is the one who asserted the quote that you hear frequently from Washington about democracies never going to war with each other. Um, which means that I guess he doesn't think this is a democracy either. Yeah. I take this as the, oh, thank you. I take your I take your presentation as kind of the same thing it has an electrical engineer making sure that as you design, you design for environmentally <clears throat> sensible solutions and you don't do something bad just because you're trying to do a job as an engineer. Um, but there's some conflicting thoughts. In, there's some built-in conflicts to some of your statements because there's a lot of this, therefore, that type statements. And the problem is humans are very complex. So, for example, let's vote the bums out of Congress, but I want to keep mine because it keeps bringing the pork to the state. I want to buy inexpensively my iPhone made in China, but I don't want to lose my job to the Chinese. That's correct. Uh, I don't want to pay more taxes, but I really want that golf course. So, so. If you can solve that problem, some of the issues that you have with democracy might be mitigated. But I think until you can solve that, you've got a fundamental problem. You have to solve that problem. Again, I'm going to have to tip you back to Rawls. I mean, Rawls' idea of making the decision behind the veil of ignorance is a brilliant piece of, of it's a brilliant extension to Kant. So the idea is um, what you want to do is you want to examine every situation from the perspective of you don't know which side of the coin you're going to be on. So if it, it's like the, 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 the algorithm for s cutting a cake between two people. I cut, you choose which piece, right? That's basically what Rawls is talking about socially. He's saying, imagine a society that was constructed so that as the society is constructed, you don't know what position you're going to have in that society. You don't know if you're going to be a corporate executive or you don't know if you're going to be a homeless person. And if you were constructing the society through that veil of ignorance, I suspect you'd be a little bit more concerned about the well-being of the homeless than a lot of people are now. The problem, of course, is you're dealing with post facto knowledge. So what you have to do is you have to construct your society going forward with an assumption that you need to build it so that everything is maximally fair, which is the antithesis of what we're doing right now. Um, you might have figured I'm not a capitalist either. Um, we have exceeded our time limit. I know some of you have to leave. Um, let, let's thank uh, Marcus one more time.